Well, I'm hoping you're having a happy 2015, and I am your host, Aaron Heath. I take a moment to thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to the very first episode in 2015 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. That would be episode number 40. Now, if you want to find the show notes, you can find them by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 040. Now, before I go on to the gun of the show, and I do have a gun of the show, and it's another Ruger, but besides that, it's a great gun. However, before we go on to the gun of the show, let me just say if you hear some background noise, especially when I'm talking, that is because, well, I have a heater going in here. Normally, I don't run a little space heater, but since I have the heater vent and the AC vent plugged off, well, I have no heat in here, and this happens to be the coldest room in, the, in my house. Now, why would I choose the coldest room in my house? Because it's the one furthest from the highway. If I was in another room, you would hear the highway sounds a lot more than you do when you hear it here. Okay, we have that out of the way, and it's time for the gun of the show. And if you happen to be getting this off the YouTube video, well, you're actually looking at the gun of the show right now. And that would be the Ruger LCP. Now, the Ruger LCP is the gun that caused an ammo shortage. Essentially, this is an improved clone of the kel uh, P3AT. Interesting play on how it sounds, P3AT, 380. However, uh, the Ruger LCP actually caused a significant interest in the 380 auto cartridge. As a result of the sudden interest, the Ruger LCP and the 380 ammo that it shoots, there was a shortage of that ammo. Now, that shortage did extend past the time when I purchased my example of the LCP, which is the one that's in the video. Interestingly enough, I found ammo and purchased it before I decided to even buy my LCP. I later acquired and installed a Crimson Trace laser guard on it, and that is also in the picture. Now, from the factory, mine was model number 3701. It has a 6 plus 1 capacity, although, let me say, there are extended magazines available for the gun. It is a double-action only firearm, even though it has a hammer. Now, it's a light gun. It's designed for pocket carry. It weighs in only at 9.65 ounces. And the sights, well, I refer to them as the three pimples, and they are fixed. Now, the fact that the sights are just basically pimples on the slide is the reason that I decided, you know, I think I'm going to add a Crimson Trace laser guard to this thing. Well, just two more things I'd like to touch on bef- about this gun before I go on. The first is, it is a polymer frame with a alloy steel slide and barrel. Now, Ruger did a good job with this gun. It, uh... It kind of brought the 380 into modern consideration. Before that, you know, the kel guns, they were good guns as long as you knew what you were doing or willing to send it back to have it serviced. A lot of the kel guns, when you got them, had to have a fluff and buff, as it was called. Basically, this was kind of cleaning up the burrs that should have been cleaned up in the manufacturing process. Well, the Ruger was a reliable gun pretty much out of the box, and that threw a lot of interest into the 380 market. If it wasn't for the Ruger LCP and the sudden interest in, I don't know, concealed carry, I don't think we would have things like the uh, Sig 938, the 238, uh, the Smith & Wesson Bodyguard 380. All these guns are due to the fact that Ruger brought the LCP to market, and they would never have brought it to market if they didn't see the kel P3AT, uh, if they did not see it being a very viable gun. And I will say this, at least with the people I know, when the LCP was no longer available because everybody had bought one or bought it up, the kel sales kind of surged in my area. And I have a feeling that was a kind of a nationwide thing. So, and I'm going to say so because of the Ruger, kel kind of benefited, even though it was really their design that was kind of copied. However, it's time to let you know how to get the show, and this show is available on YouTube. And you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and play that audio and I'll be right back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website gunrightsintexas.com. Well, we are back, and let me just say that it's great to be back. Last week, I was not feeling very well, and I pulled an evergreen episode out of storage and said, hey, let's just play this, and it worked out well. You had an episode, 
It wasn't about politics. It wasn't about guns. And this episode's going to be less about politics and more about looking at where we've been and where we're going to go. But before I do that, let me say that this is the first time I have run every piece of the upgraded studio. And I want to give you a quick rundown of some of the things we got going on here. We have the same mixer that's been used since uh, the Pro Gun podcast had its very aborted attempt with a network experience. I have a rack mount uh, compressor. It's a four-channel compressor. I have a eight-channel headphone amp. Now, this may seem like overkill considering there's only one of me, but because of the Pro Gun podcast and the fact I intend to bring guests in on this podcast in studio, I kind of need more headphone capability. There was one point I could have had six guests here on the podcast and I didn't have headphones for them. Well, we're going to try doing a roundtable in person. It may not be here, but it may be somewhere else. And I just take the equipment with me. I have a power conditioner and then I have a rack a rack assembly to mount it all in. Now, the mixer isn't mounted in the rack, although I could probably do that. I should look into it. Nah, I won't. That's just too much work. Well, let's move on because... I'm tired of talking about equipment. Let's talk about, well, let's talk about guns. You know, we just got through Christmas. We got through the new year. And, well, if anybody got any interesting guns they want to email me about, feel free to send an email. If you want to talk about it, feel free to leave a voicemail. And all that information that you need to get in touch with the show is available in the contact promo, which will run later in the show. However, before that, I'm going to run social media contact promo or the social media promo or audio clip or whatever the heck you want to call it because it's time for that so we can actually get to the meat and potatoes of the show. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at Gun Rights in TX. On Facebook and Google Plus, it is Gun Rights in Texas. So please be social. Well, you are hereby welcome to the new year on the Pro Gun Podcast, the Gun Rights in Texas Podcast, and anything else I do relating to social media and all that. However, I need to give you some New Year's goals and resolutions. Now, the last episode, I didn't actually announce on Facebook, Twitter, or any of the other social media outlets, and I'm going to take care of that. So, let's go ahead, and we're going to talk about the New Year's goals and resolutions. The first one is, we want to report on all Texas legislation relating to guns and gun rights. Now, we're not going to take, and we're not going to jump on the, well, this bill would make it easier for illegal aliens to cross the border, and then their kids will be legal, uh, legally able to vote after they're born here, and they're more than likely going to vote against guns, so we need to kill this bill now. We're not going to report on that type of thing, because I don't think we have to worry about that. When we have these people come across the border, these immigrants, we need to take and we need to Americanize them, bring them up, bring them into our system. And then we get converts to gun rights. Basically, what I'm saying is we need to take advantage of what the of what our opposition is doing. We need to bring them in. We need to welcome them. Now, I'm not saying we need to welcome the criminals. I'm saying we need to welcome the ones that, that are here because they want to work. We want to, We want to make it easier for them. But at the same time, we want to make it more difficult for the criminals. And some people may say, well, that sounds like you're kind of backtracking. No, I think we need to take the ones that are being brought in illegally that are going to end up having what's called anchor babies. And we need to take and we need to Americanize them. We need to expose them to gun rights, let them know that this is their right when they're here in the United States. Then we take the we take the whole idea that. Hey, you have this right to own guns, and you need to use this right, and you need to defend this right. And we need to convert these people into gun people. And because of that, we are not going to report on any of the crazy, long, this leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to that, which leads to this. And that may be bad for gun rights because of this. We're not going to report on that. We're going to report on all Texas legislation relating to gun rights. We may touch on some federal stuff too, but mostly we're going to concern ourselves with the state of Texas. Now, we are going to release some special edition episodes relating to legislation. I'm thinking when something passes or gets shot down, we'll release an episode about it. And I'm going to become far more active on social media. That's right. Get ready. Here I come. Now, we are going to try to do more guests and more roundtables. 
And we're going to try to basically turn 2015 into the year of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and let's take a look at something that I'm kind of proud of. Let's take a look at 2014 and go through what happened then, at least from the point of view of this podcast. Now, early in 2014, I launched the Open Carry Report podcast because, of well, things happened in Andrews, Texas in 2013, late December, and I think uh, October or November, there were a few events that happened there. Well, the Open Carry Report was launched. Now, we had some pretty good and, well, let me just rephrase that. We had some great and very influential guests on the podcast. And I'm going to go by alphabetical order on the last name if I can actually pull that off. First off, we had Masad Ayub. If you don't know who Masad Ayub is, well, I'm sorry, but you really need to get your head out from under whatever rock you're under. We had Masad Ayub on talking about the importance of training. And we also had Charles Cotton on. He was part of a roundtable. Now, Charles Cotton is uh, the founder, and uh, I don't know what his official title is, but he he runs the Texas Firearms Coalition. He's also involved with the TSRA. He's a member of the board of directors for the NRA. And when you get right down to it, if you want Texas politics and you want to have it about gun rights, Charles Cotton is the one you need to talk to. And I'm, I'll be honest, I'm proud to know Charles Cotton from this podcast and his forum, Texas CHL Forum. I like to communicate with him, and I'm gonna, I've said this before. If you hear me say something that is in opposition to something Charles Cotton said, go with what he said. He knows what he's talking about. He's been doing this far longer than I have. I'm just a guy with a microphone. He's a guy with a lot more experience. Our next guest that we had was James Franklin from Come and Take It. Now, I met James Franklin when, and he was actually involved in the discussions that got this podcast going, but I was talking to him and... Uh, well, I met him in Andrews, Texas, when they had their first march that got shut down because they did not have a parade permit. You know, that brings something to mind I need to, I need to communicate with James about. And then we had C.J. Grisham. Now, if you don't know who C.J. Grisham is, you're not really following the open carry movement or at least the open carry in Texas movement because C.J. Grisham is the founder and president of Open Carry Texas. Now, C.J. was involved in the same roundtable that we had Charles Cotton involved in, and C.J. Grisham was involved in the second roundtable we put on. The second roundtable also included Terry Holcomb from Texas Carry and Tammy Kuntz from Gun Rights Across America. She, well, excuse me, Tammy Kuntz is, if I am not mistaken, the Texas coordinator for Gun Rights Across America. We had the three of them, and we had another gentleman that was on later that I'll talk about later because we're going by alphabetical order and his last name starts with a Z and that means he'll be the one of the last ones we discuss. Actually, he will be the last one we discuss. However, Terry Holcomb is also known as Pastor Terry. Now, Terry, he's a uh, he's the president of Texas Carry. I believe he founded it. He is very involved in Texas politics. And while he does have a bone to pick with the TSRA and the NRA, I do believe that he's probably one of the more moderate of the newer or he's Him and his organization are probably one of the more moderate of the open carry movement organizations. Now, Gun Rights Across America, they're a little different in how they're operating. They started out, I believe, because of Texas, and they uh, tried to go national. I don't know all the details about how they kind of did their thing, but, you know, they've had a pretty interesting experience themselves. Now, we did have another individual from Open Carry Texas involved, and that would be Victoria Montgomery. We had her on, and she was expecting a baby at the time, and I believe that she should have had the baby by now, so I'm going to go ahead and say congratulations to Victoria and her husband. And then we had Charles Nichols from the California Right to Carry organization. Now, Charles is uh, Charles Nichols is, I believe he is still fighting a, lo- uh, a lawsuit that he filed, and his goal is to restore open carry through litigation. Unfortunately, he's not doing it here in Texas. He's doing it in California. Now, the one non-gun podcaster or the non-gun person that I had on the podcast is a gun owner. He's a friend of mine. He's a bit further left than I am. And he's also a podcaster. Now, he, he is known as Mark Olson. He is also known as Luna C. And he's one of the hosts of the Austonians podcast. I don't know if they put an episode out recently or not. I've been so busy, I really haven't had time to catch up on it. In fact, I'm kind of running behind on the podcast to have follow for guns, too. And then our next guest was a participant in the first roundtable we were successful in pulling off, 
and that would be Alice Tripp. Now, she was on with Charles Cotton and C.J. Grisham, and if you don't know who Alice Tripp is, well, you're probably living under a rock as well. She is the, she's the legislative director for the Texas State Rifle Association, and let me say that uh, I've spoken with her twice. I spoke with her on the phone once before I had her on the podcast, and then I spoke to her on the podcast. She reminds me of a teacher I had when I was in high school. And some people say that's a bad thing. Some people say that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And I will say this. I would be terrified if I was on the opposite end of the political spectrum from Alice Tripp. Let's just say that if anybody can get something done in the Texas legislature, it's Alice Tripp. Now, our next guest is kind of a famous individual nationwide because of what they do in their own state. That would be Philip Van Cleve from the Virginia Citizens Defense League. Now, Philip Van Cleve was actually our very first guest on the podcast, and he was also the guest that was going to be on the first roundtable that kind of fell flat. Instead of a roundtable, it was more like a card table. And, uh, well, basically, he was a guest on the podcast twice, and I was kind of impressed with him. I learned a lot about the power of a mailing list thanks to Philip Van Cleve. Now, we, we have had two attorneys on the podcast. When we brought in Charles Cotton, he was the first attorney. He, uh, I'll be honest, if there's any kind of Texas firearms legislation, Charles Cotton probably has something to do with it. Either he's fighting against it, he's fighting for it, or he's written it, or some combination thereof. Now, the second attorney that we had on was Edwin Walker from the Texas Law Shield. Now, Edwin Walker was involved in the final resolution of the situation in Andrews that kind of got this podcast launched. I would like to say that I am very pleased that I had the opportunity to speak to Mr. Walker, and I think that he is probably one of the best people we could have on our side in the gun rights movement. And our final guest, who was a member of our third round table, and he was going to be part of the first round table, that, the one that turned into a card table. However, he had a situation come up and was unable to, uh, to participate in the first one, but he was successful in the second successful round table. He was involved in it, along with Tammy Coons, Terry Holcomb, and C.J. Grisham. And that would be Eddie Zizek. Now, Eddie is a wonderful individual. He is, uh, the, I believe he's the president. If not, he's, uh, he's the equivalent to president of the Oklahoma Open Carry Association. I will say that uh, we have had a long history of outsiders coming into Texas since the Civil War and interfering with our gun rights. It was carpetbaggers that got the prohibition on the carry of handguns involved in the first place. Now, Eddie's an outsider, but he's actually on our side, and he's welcome to help. I will say this, Eddie's not a carpetbagger. He's a fellow Southern gentleman, and I would be more than glad to take him to the range sometime. Now, as a result of the guests that we've had on the podcast, I have to say I have learned a lot. I have actually learned a lot that could be used towards building an effective gun rights organization. And if you listen to the Open Carry Report podcast when I've had these guests on, you can learn it too. And I also learned a lot about what a gun rights organization needs in order to get things done. Now, as I have said when I was talking about our guest, we did attempt three roundtables and we had two that were successful. The first one fell flat, the first attempt. It was still a great episode and I would love it if people went back and downloaded and listened to that episode. And I would like to also go ahead and thank Philip Van Cleve again for uh, helping me out with that episode. Okay, well, let's go ahead and talk about the two that were actually successful now. The first one was, like I said, between Charles Cotton, Alice Tripp, and C.J. Grisham. Now, I'll be honest, that roundtable did not go anything like what I had in mind. But it was probably one of the most, if not the most, important gun rights podcast episodes of 2014. I will say it was the most important podcast of this show. It was also used by, as part of a major news market uh, or news network. Blah. Let me get my tongue untied. It was actually part used as part of a major market newscast. And you can find that episode in the, uh, in the archives, still available for download. And I strongly recommend reading that or going back, reading the show notes and listening to that episode. And the third roundtable we did in 2014 was part of an effort to establish communication between Texas and Oklahoma organizations for open carry. However, things changed and the open carry report started becoming toxic because it was relating to Texas and anything relating to open carry and Texas 
became toxic because of certain groups and their uh, bad behavior. And we're still seeing some of that bad behavior from one of those groups. As a result, I rebranded the Open Carry Report as the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. And, well, this should make it easier to get guests on when they realize, hey, he's not here to talk about uh, force-feeding everybody open carry. He's here to talk about gun rights. As a result, I think we're going to have a much better show. Well, some things I want to do, I want to actually go out and I want to do some serious advantage or serious upgrades to the podcast. In 2015, there probably won't be any hardware upgrades, but you'll probably see a few uh, changes. We may actually go ahead and create uh, some other social media accounts. We'll see about that. However, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. And while I, while I play that, I want to go do something and I'll be right back about the time it's finished. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. All right, I am back. And let me say that the news in this episode is going to be kind of stale, but it's important that we get it out there. First off, um, most of the news is actually what was going to be done on last week's episode. But because I pulled an evergreen episode, this news is still relevant. I cut some of it, but the things I want to touch on are still here. I added a little bit, but I didn't add too much because I didn't want to overload us with too much news. And we're going to go to the crime blotter. You know, the first story we have under the, cl- bl- under the crime blotter, police have released a sketch of the man wanted in relation to the shooting of a TV station meteorologist, Patrick Crawford. Now, Crawford told police he did not know his attacker, and investigators still do not have a motive for the attack or a name for the suspect. Hmm, interesting. Now, there was a later news article, like the on Sunday or Saturday. Anyways, after I had decided, well, I'm not doing an episode because I'm just too sick. Uh, there was an article that came out that said that um, Patrick Crawford was out of the hospital and he was recovering. That's good news to hear, and we want to keep Mr. Crawford in our prayers. And now we have our second story under the crime blotter. A suspect is do- dead due to action due to his own actions following a car chase. Now the suspect pretended to surrender to the officer who stopped him. However, he drew a weapon and fired four shots at the officer who returned fire, killing the suspect. Now, the officer was unharmed, even though his uniform was grazed by the shots. This particular officer is with the Hedwig Village, Texas Police Department. Now, I'm going to say that the good Lord smiled on this officer. And uh, when you have a round touch the uniform of an officer, but not touch the officer himself, that is a close call. Now, we're going to move into the politics category. And we have, well, we have a whole bunch of news in that category. In fact, I think that's where all the news that remain. Well, there may be one article that's not in the politics. So let's move on. Politics. Our first story comes to us where we have two different police chiefs who hold different positions on the subject of open carry. First off, Beaumont, Texas police chief or the Beaumont, Texas police chief has no problem with open carry, even if he doesn't know how the public will react to it. And that's good. Basically saying, hey, it's their right. We want to see that right restored. We're okay with it. We'll, dis- we'll go with whatever the legislature decides and not have a problem. Now, the article is more or less about the second officer or the poli- second chief, who is the police chief of Port Arthur, Texas. Now, his name is Mark Blanton, and he is opposed to the legalization of open carry for modern handguns. Basically, he uses the same old FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt that all the gun banners use to try and kill open carry and anything else relating to advancing the ball when it comes to gun rights. You know what? We're going to use that hashtag, move the ball forward or something like that. I'll, I'll pull that up and uh, get it to you. In fact, that'll instead of a legislative update, because we're fixing to really get into the legislative process, we're going to run, we're going to talk about the hashtags that we're going to use or the hashtag I'm going to use instead of the legislative update for this episode. However, let's move on to the next political story, which is about our outgoing Texas Land Commissioner, Jerry Patterson, who was photographed outside the Alamo with a replica of an 1847 Colt Walker, 
which if I had his last name, I would kind of run with a replica of a Colt Patterson for photo ops. You know, last name's Patterson, Colt Patterson. Anyways, Patterson has been a friend of gun rights here in Texas. And well, this has been pretty much the whole I mean, this is, well, he's done this his whole career. He's been a friend of gun rights. He's recently said a few things that were kind of, well, maybe not 100% on board, but he's been a good friend of gun rights here in Texas. And the article that uh, that he's actually shown in this photograph has a headline of, first to ban open carry, Texas could be one of the last to okay it. Well, that headline should actually be the, the first to ban carry at all texas could be one of the last to okay it. well actually that doesn't have quite the same ring of truth because well we have had okayed carry but mm, well we'll move on before i dig myself any deeper now the next news story in the political category comes to us thanks to wendy davis now one forum i frequent had a discussion about wendy davis announcing her support for open carry now this announcement was made when she was running for the governor of texas and at that time, I said she only supported open carry as long as she thought it could help her. Now that she has lost that election, she has come forward to announce that she regrets her previous support of open carry. I personally suspect she feels it actually hurt her chances because, well, it alienated her kind of crazy radical base that she kind of pulls from. If I was the Republicans, I would love it if they, uh, if the Democrats tried to run Wendy Davis on the presidential ticket either as a presidential candidate or a vice presidential candidate. Simply put, she can scuttle anything. However, we are going to move on to the next topic, which is kind of tied in. You know what? We're going to skip that one. We'll come back to it because it ties into the last article I want to talk about. In fact, I want to move that one from the political category into the miscellaneous category, and it will be the last article. That means we got one more article in the political category, which is a story where the Texas City Police Department has had to deal with a confrontation between two groups of protesters. The first protest was organized by the family of a man killed by police when he reportedly pointed a gun at that officer. Now, here's a helpful hint. If you point a gun at a police officer, expect to get shot. Now, the second protest was a counter-protest in support of the officers. And apparently there's some kind of confrontation. The police kind of told these people to separate and leave each other alone, basically. Now, when it comes to Open Carry Texas, C.J. Grisham, um, well, let me say that I tend to prefer not talking about C.J. Grisham. I've had him on the podcast. I, I kind of I called him out on a few things. He made some personal attacks. And basically, because I don't agree with him 100%, I'm in the camp of the butters, as he would put it. Some some people have actually attacked and threatened me, or attacked uh, as in internet attacks. But I have been attacked. I have been threatened as a uh, as a result of having a disagreement with him. And he he claims that these are not his people, but he really hasn't said, "Hey, if anybody is doing this on my behalf, you need to stop." He hasn't done that, which kind of speaks volumes. But that's beside the point. However. C.J. Grisham was a finalist for the Texan of the Year. You know what? I never did find out who won that. And we're going to find that out right now. I don't think it was C.J. Grisham where we would, we would have heard about it. We're now pulling up the Dallas News website, and that's the link. I want to include the link to the Texan of the Year instead of the link to the article. But C.J. Grisham was one of the finalists for it, and as a result, there was a lot of hoopla about it from open carry supporters, gun rights supporters, and so on. Now, Dallas Morning News actually announced the winner when episode 40 was scheduled to be released. I say scheduled to be released because it released late since the scheduling system in WordPress failed. But that's a technical issue that's neither here nor there. And the winners of the 2014 Texans of the Year, they, inc- they increased it to three, the Ebola Warriors. Well, this means that C.J. Grisham did not win it. And, uh, well, I have to say that that's interesting. In a way, I kind of wish C.J. had won it. But that's just between us, okay? I know, everybody that can download this, it's between me and everybody that actually does download and listen or gets told about it. But that's beside the point. However, I do have to throw some props out to C.J. Grisham. 
and I will include a link to it. But you see, CJ called out uh, Corey Watkins because, and Corey Watkins is a leader of Open Carry Tarrant County. You now, some people may say, well, why are we talking about Open Carry Tarrant County and CJ Grisham? Well, you see, CJ Grisham called out Corey Watkins because Corey and his bunch have been doing things that are hurting the efforts. Now, the media is making a big fuss about it because, oh, there's division in the open carry market or the open carry camps. But that's not true. There's always been some division, but it's not like what the media is putting on. I think in the end, the open carry movement's going to actually go ahead and pull together and we're going to get something passed, even if it isn't House Bill 195, because, well, there's too much going on that's going to hurt it. But I'm going to include a link to the article or to the Facebook post where CJ actually calls out Corey because it ties in to the next article we're going to talk about. And that article is where Open Carry Tarrant County is planning a, uh, well, they're planning to protest the arrest of two of their members. One member was charged with interfering with a traffic stop as part of a cop watch effort he was a participant in. Basically, he was armed. He was participating in a cop watch deal, and they have video. However, the video only starts just about the time the officers start coming over to arrest him. And you really question, why do we only have that part of the video? I mean, these guys go out there, they video the whole stop as soon as they get there, and obviously they've been there a while, so why why isn't there more video of the lead-up to the encounter? I don't know. But there is no video leading up to this, except maybe what the police are going to release. Now, the second uh, member of OCTC that was arrested was arrested for interfering with an emergency domestic disturbance call. Now, one of them was unarmed at the time, and the other was armed, I believe. I've heard conflicting reports, but those seem to be the more consistent. And this is almost exactly what C.J. Grisham was warning Corey Watkins about. This is as extreme as Corey was being warned about but it's a step in that direction. And I have to hand it to C.J. Grisham. He called this one right before it ever happened. And Corey, if you're listening to this, for the love of God, man, grow up, get your group under control, and quit making it open carry Tarrant County about you and your personality and all your little socialist quasi-libertarian efforts. That's right. I said socialist quasi-libertarian because... It seems like you have people that are pretending to be libertarians while wanting socialism. I'm not quite sure how that works. Actually, I think Corey Watkins is more of an anarchist libertarian, which true libertarians don't like anarchy either. True libertarians see a need for government, although it needs to be a very minimal government. Anarchists, no government at all. However, mm, that doesn't last very long because somebody always establishes one at the point of a sword or the barrel of a gun. However, let me just say this. C.J. Grisham, you called him out on it. He didn't listen, and two of his people are in jail as a result. I wish he had listened to you. And this is the kind of leadership that uh, C.J. Grisham needs to show for the whole open carry movement. He needs to say, look, you're making a mistake. Grow up and do the right thing. Well, I'm going to play the sign-off music, and then we're going to talk about hashtag, whatever it is. All right? Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Okay, we are back, and this is normally where we would have the whole gun rights in Texas, um, you know, legislative, uh, you know, where we touch on the legislative update, but we're not doing that this time, simply because, well, we're going to take a break from it and really hit it hard because in the next few episodes, the legislative session is going to start, and we're going to be swamped. We are really going to be swamped with, uh, with all kinds of legislative updates. In fact, I expect there to be special episodes because of it. However, I do want to throw out a hashtag. I want to throw out the 
hashtag move the ball forward. And basically, I want to move the ball forward on two major issues as well as a number of others. Basically, the two major issues I want to see the ball move forward on is campus carry and open carry. I want to move the ball all the way into the end zone on both of them. Uh, If we cannot get a uh, kickoff return all the way for a, a touchdown, then I will take a field goal if I have field goal if I have to. I would much rather have a touchdown. I would much rather return the uh, kickoff for a touchdown, but that's beside the point. Basically, I would love to have unlicensed open and concealed carry. Failing at that, I would love to see unlicensed open carry and licensed concealed carry. Failing at that, I will take licensed concealed and licensed open carry. And now some people say, well, you know, that's a football hashtag that you're using. Yes, I want to get this in front of a lot of the football people. I want to use these hashtags to promote the gun rights movement, the open carry movement, and pretty much anything relating to gun rights in Texas. I want to get it all out there in front of as many eyeballs as we can. With that said, it's time to sign off. So please carry responsibly and for the love of God, get ready to contact your representatives and your senators and let them know you want bills passed. Thank you.